Thank you, Nate. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, it does kind of feel like, oh, thank you, honey. It does kind of feel like the first time. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I have been overcome with my nerves this morning. Um, <laughs> amen. Not today, Satan. Um <laughs> I just want to take a moment to tell you guys, even the people that I don't know uh, in here, how much I love y'all. And I thank y'all for giving me the opportunity to come before you to preach, to practice. Um, this is a learning experience for me. Um, Nate mentioned systematic theology, and people point out all the time how thick that book is. And I'm like, yeah, it's heavy physically and mentally. Um, but it's been fun. This journey's been fun. And uh, I couldn't think of two better guys to, to learn under. And I appreciate them pouring into me and giving me the opportunity to be up here this morning. Um, so this morning, we are continuing in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we've been looking at what it would be like to be discipled by Jesus. More than that, we're looking at how to become more alive than we ever have in Christ. And today, once again, we arrive at a passage that is focused on prayer. We've seen this more than once. Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer. We saw it in the Beatitudes, and if you're not you know, I, I had to look pretty hard to see this, but God kind of highlighted it to me. We see it when Jesus is talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And he said, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. How do we feast on Jesus in prayer, in relationship, in his word, in praise and thanksgiving? And if we're not doing that, if we're not coming to Jesus in prayer, then how hungry are we really for his righteousness? I don't know about y'all, but I'm starving. My tummy's empty. And I need as much of his righteousness as I can get. I just, what kind of relationship would we have if we never talked to Jesus? I know me, you know, my wife, Denise, sitting up here in the front row. And I know that our relationship would not be a good one if we never spoke to each other. If we never took time out of our day to pour into one another, it wouldn't be one. It wouldn't be a solid marriage, but it wouldn't be a very fun, loving relationship. I mean, she's sitting up here giggling at me right now. But if we don't engage Jesus then how hungry are we? The passage on the Beatitudes um, is followed later on in uh, the Sermon on the Mount with the Lord's Prayer. We see in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches us how we should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Y'all, you guys want to see the kingdom fall in here this morning? Whew, good, I'm glad we're on the same page. This passage on the Lord's Prayer is immediately followed up with fasting. And what is fasting full of? Prayer. When we fast, we're able to fill the time that we normally would spend eating with prayer and worship and thanksgiving unto the Lord. It seems to me that prayer is a major component in heavenly discipleship. And this is what this whole series that Nate, Stephen, and myself and others have been driving through. Being discipled by Jesus himself. When you're discipled by someone, it helps to build an intimate trust with that person. The kind of relationship where even if one wrongs another, it doesn't break the trust of the relationship, but builds on it through repentance and reconciliation. 
This is the kind of relationship that God desires with us. We wrong him. Y'all, as we can try as hard as we possibly can to do everything right. But sometimes as humans, we slip up and we do something we shouldn't. But in that moment, we have the opportunity to come to our Father in heaven in prayer and repentance. And he picks us back up. He adjusts our armor, wipes it off, polishes it, and then pushes us right back onto the battlefield. And he has no less trust in us in that moment than he did before we slipped up. Today, we're going to see what happens when we make our requests known to God. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and when you get there, if you could please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to begin in verse 7. If you don't have your Bibles with you this morning, it'll be on the screens. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Let's pray. Father, God, I just thank you so much for this church. God, I, I have pages of notes. Lord, I release this entire sermon to you this morning. God, I don't want anything to come out of my mouth that does not belong to you. Holy Spirit, we want you here. We need you. We need you, Holy Spirit. Would you come and rest on each and every person in this room? Would you fill us? Would you open our eyes to the things that you want us to see this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We see three very distinct words in this passage, ask, seek, and knock. And all of these things are done through prayer. The first word, ask. Y'all, that's a loaded word when you're standing in a pulpit. And I want to be clear right out of the gate, Jesus isn't saying ask and I'll make your life comfortable or I'll make you a millionaire, or you'll have a brand new Ferrari sitting in your driveway. That would be nice, but <laughs> it's, it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. The last thing I want to do, guys, is come up here and preach this health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, because that's not going to get us anywhere. But there is validity in asking God for things we want or need if they align with his will. If you look at the word asked used in this text, it just doesn't mean ask. The Greek word is aiteo. It means to ask, obviously, beg, call for, crave, desire, and even require. Jesus is essentially saying, beg God, ask, and don't stop asking. Come to him with your desires and your needs. For those of y'all in here that don't know, I have a three-year-old daughter named Carolyn. I know most of you guys in here know her. And I'm going to tell y'all something. She's probably going to get what she wants if she comes at me 900,000 times asking me for something. Especially if it's something she needs. As her father, I'm not going to deny her needs. 
She's little. She has to rely on me to provide for her. I have to provide for her the things she wants and the things she needs. I give her a roof over her head, food in her stomach, clothes on her back. As her father, I want to give her those things. It's not something that I just do out of sheer obligation. It brings me joy to provide for my little girl. I also want to give her things that she's not expecting. I love it when I see Carolyn's face light up when I walk in the door with something for her, and it was just completely out of the blue. It makes, it makes my life just, I mean, it just fills me with joy. I love it. I love it. But it's not just about how much she asks me for something when she wants it. How she asks plays a part in how I respond to her. Her attitude affects my decision to grant her request as much as the number of times she makes it. There's two factors that I want to point to that almost always merit a no from daddy when Carolyn comes to ask me for something. Number one, if she doesn't need it or it's bad for her, even though she might not understand why I'm saying no, my decisions are based on my knowledge of what's best for her. I'm her father. And as her father, I understand from my own personal life experiences what Scripture says and through my relationship with my Father in heaven, what's good for my little girl. And number two, like I said before, her attitude when she's making a request plays a factor in how I respond. If she comes at me in disrespect or in anger or she's done something that's got her in trouble and she's trying to change the subject by asking me for something chances are she's not going to get it she's also not going to get what she wants if she comes to me give me goldfish <laughs> hold on little child if she comes at me demanding something of me instead of asking, my answer is probably going to be no. Even if it is something she needs, her attitude plays on whether or not she gets it or not. <laughs> when I say no, this is, this is fun. When I say no, if mommy is anywhere in the room, she, cre she screams, starts crying, and runs directly to mommy. And she tries to play mommy out of getting what she wants because daddy was the bad guy in her eyes. I told her no. I didn't give her what she wanted. I don't find joy in telling my daughter no. It breaks my heart. This is the same way with God. We're his children. Y'all know that? We are children of God and he responds to us like a loving father I want to take a moment I want to look at a couple of scriptures that point to this aspect of our identity the first one is John chapter 1 verse 12 but to all who did receive him who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God. He gave the right to become children of God. He signed our adoption papers. It is finished. The next verse is Romans chapter 8 verse 16. I love this one. This one's fun. Because you get to experience this one. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. 
the, the Holy Spirit himself, himself declares to our spirit that we are children of God. God himself comes into us and tells us himself that we belong to him. The last verse is 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. I love that. That last little piece. And so we are. It goes on. It, it continues. It said, this is the reason why the world does not know us is because the world does not know God. So therefore, since he doesn't know God, he's not going to know his children. There's a point I want to make here. As a father, sometimes the answer is no. And this is going to sound familiar, but there's two factors I want to point out that could merit a no from God. Not always, but there's two factors I want to mention. Number one, if you don't need it or it's bad for you, even though you might not understand why God is saying no, his decisions are based on his knowledge of what's best for you. He's your father. He created you. Scripture says he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows everything about you. The number of hairs on your head, or in my case, the lack thereof. Your thoughts. He knows your desires. He knows the things that make you happy. But he also knows the things that bring you pain. And this, I hope it doesn't, but this might come as a surprise to someone in the room today. He also knows the things you're trying to hide from him. And he knows the things that you're trying to hide from other people as well. God is a God that dwells in the secret places. You can't escape it. He knows you. He knows everything about you and if you don't need it or it's bad for you out of love he's probably not going to grant it to you number two our attitude when we're making a request to God can play a factor in how he responds if we come at him disrespectfully in anger or we have unconfessed sin in our life that we're still walking in, we're probably not going to get anything we want. We also aren't getting anything we want if we come to God demanding it of Him instead of asking Him. How arrogant. I've done this. And I got called out while I was preparing this. How arrogant. Do we have to be to demand something from God? Being able to speak to Him is a privilege. How dare we come make demands from God? The very being that could snuff our existence off of the planet with a very breath. And we're going to come at Him making demands. Because I know a lot of times when I'm making demands of something, I'm doing it out of anger I'm upset I'm frustrated about something and I come up I'm like give it to me now or what God give it to me now what are you going to do you're going to come make empty oaths and promises that you can't keep I preached on that in my last sermon we got to do better when we come to God don't come making demands. He's your father. He wants to provide for you. He wants it. 
It's not a matter of if you do this and this and this and this and this, then I'll give you this. He wants to provide for you. He wants to give you the things that he that you desire. If the answer from God is no, then I should probably reevaluate my ask. Is what I'm asking for biblical? Does it even align with scripture? Is it what the Lord desires for my life? Because if it's not, should we be asking for it to begin with? We should also be cautious as to how we respond when God says no. Or even wait. Wait's not a fun word either. I... Y'all might notice my hair and my beard are a little longer than they normally are. In December, uh, the Lord told me to stop cutting my hair on my head. So I made, I made a vow to the Lord because I was walking in a hidden sin. I would spend hours in front of the mirror trying to get my beard and my hair to lay perfect my clothes had to be perfect. They couldn't be wrinkled. They couldn't be stained. They had to be perfect. And I was judging people. I didn't like what I saw when I looked in the mirror. And I was judging people based on how I felt about myself. And God in December was like, hey, you need to lay that down, bro. And I want you to, st- I don't want you to cut your hair. I can't trim my hair. I can't trim my beard for a year. And I'm going to tell yeah, a year. A year. A, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to look like Noah just with a bald spot right here in the middle of my head. A year. But I'm going to tell you all, this is annoying. It's driving me nuts. I've had multiple times where I've come to our prayer team and I've been like, hey, I have a question for God and it's a yes or no answer. And they're like, what's the question? I'm like, no, he, know, he knows what the question is. And every time they're like, um, no. Or in, in the fullness of time, I got that one one time. And I'm just like, God, I really, really, really want a haircut. But... As I pray, <laughs> I love you, baby. <laughs> oh, man. I made a vow, though. I made a vow. And I understand the gravity of making a vow to God, and I'm not going to break it unless He Himself releases me from it. There may be a lesson in his no or his wait that he is trying to get us to learn. Mine is don't be so hard on others based on how you feel about yourself. And apparently that's a lesson that I'm still having to walk through because I can't get a haircut. It's okay. It's okay. I kind of like it. It's less maintenance. There may be other things. Like I said, there might be a lesson that he wants to teach us before he says yes. There may be other things that need to happen before he does say yes. There are a lot of factors that we can't see ourselves that play into an answer from God. So we should be cautious of jumping to conclusions is if the response is an immediate no or a wait or even something that we weren't expecting. If the answer is no, we should take a second and reevaluate. Like I said before, if it's something something that isn't biblical or isn't God's heart, move on. Drop it, let it go, but don't do it out of anger. Don't get mad at God because he wants the best for you. If it's something that is biblical, or if it's something that you feel God calling you into, 
and you ask and he says no or wait, then wait in faith. If it's a no, come back and ask again later. Walk by faith. God could be using this to show you something way better than you could ever imagine and use that no as an opportunity to exercise your faith and submission to Jesus as Lord of your life. So when we're submitted to Jesus as Lord and He says no, it's okay. Because we know that he has our best interest in mind. But then there's this. And this happens more often than any of us would like to admit. When we don't get what we want, our response is to run like Carolyn, run screaming and crying right back into the world. Because God said no, and we think He doesn't like us because He didn't give us what we wanted or we thought we needed. In that moment, we think the world will fill our immediate need and we can get what we want another way. Satan uses the temptations of worldly riches and false comforts to drag us away from God on a daily basis. I've heard of people who have straight walked away from Jesus and the church and anything good God had planned for their life just because God said no or they didn't get what they wanted or thought they needed. It seems to me like the world and even some Christians only think about turning to God or asking Him for something when they need something in an emergency or they want to feel good. That's the only time they ever talk to God. Is when they've hit panic mode. It's a one-sided, give me, give me, give me relationship. I want everything you have for me, but I'm not going to do anything in return. I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to build my relationship with you and walk with you. I just want you in an in, in, in emergency. And then when God says no to those kind of people, they lose their minds. And they jump to the immediate conclusion that God doesn't love them. There's even churches. There's even churches that avoid sensitive subjects because they're scared that they're going to make people uncomfortable. They avoid subjects like hell, consequences of sin. They want people to feel good. They want people to feel good when they come to ask for God in their state of emergency. Not talking about this stuff to me is the most unloving thing we can do as followers of Jesus. Not telling someone about Jesus or the consequences of sin and allowing them to continue walking the way they are is essentially condemning them to death. There are very real and serious consequences for not choosing to follow Jesus. I can see the look on some of y'all faces. I promise I'm going to bring it back around to ask. There's a very real place called hell and I'm going to talk about it today because the Lord laid it on my heart as I was preparing this hell is not a fun place you want to go to society and movies in Hollywood paint hell as this place of party you can do whatever you want whenever you want to do it and there's absolutely no consequences whatsoever as I was writing this, the movie, uh, it was an Adam Sandler movie called Little Nicky that came to mind. 
Guys, I see some of you. I'm glad I'm not like the oldest person in the room. Um, but it really did. It painted hell as this place where you can just you just go party all the time. You have everything you want. You have everything your heart desires. And it's just going to be an absolute party for the rest of your life. That's not it at all, y'all. Scripture says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be no rest in our bodies. If you wind up there, we'll be tortured for eternity in a lake of fire. As a Christian, why in the world would we ever be okay with letting someone go to hell because we're too uncomfortable addressing the things that need to be addressed? Nate preached on it last week. You can't judge me. Well, yeah, as a brother in Christ, I very much will point out the sin in your life and walk through that with you because I love you. Are we so wrapped up in our lives that we're willing to let people pass through our lives without telling them the good news of what Jesus did for us? Or the spiritual ramifications if they don't choose to follow him? I heard it once asked, if God loves us so much, then why would he create a place like hell? And why would he ever send people there? When God created hell, his desire wasn't for us to go there. But in his foreknowledge and his sovereignty, he knew that there would be people that would never choose him. If you don't choose God, then you have chosen the side of eternal punishment. And this is not a choice that God is going to make for us. It's something that we have to do on our own. He's not going to hold a gun to your head and be like, choose me or die. We have to make it on our own. There's hope. There's hope. I promise this gets lighter. There's hope. Oh, thank God for hope. God, in His love and in His mercy and abounding grace, gives us a choice to follow Him. Not only that, He gave us a way to do it. He gave us a way out. He sent His Son Jesus to pay the debt that we owed and to die the death that we deserved on the cross. God doesn't want this for us. And like I said, He's given us everything we need through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to be free from the eternal punishment in hell. All we have to do is ask that's it. All you have to do is ask to make Jesus. Will you please come be the Lord and Savior of my life? That's it. A cool thing that happens when we make this particular ask is our desires. When we submit to Jesus, our desires will start to align with God's desires. From here out, we're growing closer to Him through prayer and worship. As we grow closer to God, the things we ask for will begin to align with His will for our life and the lives of others around us. As we die to ourselves, we begin to focus our attention on God and what He wants to do in us and through us. Is it, it no longer becomes about what we want. And our asks will mirror that. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. When we delight in the Lord and we have submitted to Him as Lord of our lives... Our desires become things that He wants 
and we take joy in that, he will begin to give us the things that we desire in our hearts because they align with his will. 1 John 5.14 And this confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. As our fleshly, selfish, worldly desires fade away, we begin to see things in situations and people as God does. Our asks go from empty words or requests and become things that we know God desires for his creation. We begin to ask for things like wisdom and discernment and grace and peace and even provision. It's okay to ask God for provision. I have to ask for it every day. I wouldn't be standing up here if I didn't have it. I trust my Lord, my daddy, my father. I trust him to provide the things that I need to continue walking in the will of, in his will that he has for my life. I trust him and I submit to him. Some days it's harder than others. Jesus mentions asking and receiving many times while he was on earth with his disciples. He also says, we'll get an answer. Matthew 18, 19, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive faith. Everything I ask my Father for in prayer, because I have faith and trust in him that he will continue to provide for me and my family. I, I'm not going to tell you 100% of the time it happens, but God over the past three years has blown my mind. We hit a panic moment when I decided to step away from my full-time job and go into ministry. And it was like, I have no idea how we're going to continue to pay our bills. This was tax time. And in that moment, I was just like, Danae, I trust God. I trust him. I don't know why. I've never felt like this before, but I trust them. And we started doing the numbers. And over the course of the internship, I had the exact dollar amount that I would have had had I continued working in my previous job up until the end of the residency. Not only that, I had money coming in from people that started supporting me in my internship. We even got enough to go on vacation. The first, the first family vacation that we had ever taken as husband and wife, besides our honeymoon, we got to go on when I stepped out in faith and submitted to God and desired His will instead of mine. God wants to give us good things. As we read in Matthew chapter 7, or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father give you in heaven? There's a verse that aligns with this in Luke chapter 11. It's Luke chapter 11, verse 11 through 13. It's the almost a mirror image, except the end is different. And I want to point that out. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You guys want them this morning? Y'all didn't sound like you really did. 
I know I do. Come, Holy Spirit. We want you here. Come on, pour yourself out on us. We want revival in this city. How much more of the Holy Spirit will God give us if we just ask? It's that simple. Ask. When Jesus makes these statements, these verses that I just read, he's not just addressing the masses. He's speaking to his disciples. He's talking to the people that are closest to him, that are walking in line with him and following him, the ones that gave up everything when he said, follow me. That's the people he's talking to in these moments. The people who are children of God. This again points to a father-child relationship when he it comes to us and asking God. We should be like a child when we come to Him. Persistence. Childlike faith and trust in Him to provide what we need. And like I said, the things He provides are good. He wants it. He wants us to have good things. He wants us to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times, He delights in giving it to us when we're not expecting it. That's what makes it fun. When you're ministering to somebody, and next thing you know, like, what just happened? Like, oh, what? Hold on just a second. They're crying, you're crying. People down the street are crying. God's presence is just all over everything. You got a guy laying out on the ground over here, and you're like, God, what the heck just happened? He goes, surprise. <laughs> it brings him joy. It brings him joy. He's not going to give us stones instead of bread. Look at the, look, look at the Israelites. When they left Egypt, they had to wander the desert for 40 years because they spit in God's face. But you know what he did? He still provided for them because he doesn't want to give his children stones instead of bread. Our relationship, the relationship like that with God gives us a desire to seek him as well. This is the next word that you see in Matthew chapter 7. Seek. It clearly states that if we seek God, we'll find Him. But how do we seek God? In prayer, reading, meditation on Scripture. We dig even harder. We dig for Jesus. We dig for God's faith or face. Like he is a treasure, like a diamond lost in a desert. We do whatever it takes to find it. We begin to seek his will for our lives and those around us. And you know what the reward for seeking is? Finding. We'll find that diamond in the desert. Psalms chapter 9, verse 10. And those who know your name put their trust in you, O Lord. You have not forsaken those who seek you. If we seek him, we will find him. Sometimes you just got to keep looking. Psalm 17, verse 7. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Not only can we seek his face and his presence, but we can seek refuge in him as well. When Satan is hammering on you, God, 
in you I take refuge. And he goes, I got you, baby. I got you. Satan ain't going to touch you today. He's been defeated. I love this one. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing that I have asked of the Lord that I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in His temple. David gets it, y'all. Oh Lord, that I seek after. He's seeking. Let me dwell in your house and gaze upon your beauty. He's asking. Let me inquire in your temple. He's knocked and the door has been opened. The amazing thing about God's answer in this is, okay, come on in. Because it's what I want for you. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. And this leads me to the last word we see in this passage. Knock. Y'all, it's that simple. Knock and keep knocking. Knock and keep knocking. There's a story in Luke chapter 11 of a man. uh, Jesus is teaching a parable of a man who goes to a friend's house. And he's like banging on the door. He's like, hey, I just had some people show up in town and I need some bread. That guy in that moment understood that his friend had what he needed on the other side of the door. He knew it. He knew what was on the other side of the door was something he needed, he wanted, and he kept knocking. And he kept knocking until homeboy got up out of bed and opened the door. And he's like, what you need? I need some bread. (laughs) I need some bread. Knock, and the door will be opened. The door to heaven is easily opened for those who seek it and knock. Even the simplest, even the simplest, the little children, people that don't quite get it yet, can knock. Blind people can knock. Deaf people can knock. Mute people can knock. God gives us a way to open the door to heaven. We know, like I said, we know what's behind the door is so good that we're going to bang on it until it opens. I read that if we're knocking, then that also implies that there's some form of resistance. Doors serve a purpose to let things in that need to be there, that belong. But they also keep the things that don't need to be there out. If the door to heaven is an opening, it can mean one of two things. I want you guys to picture this like a concert and you're trying to get backstage. So the first thing I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say with as much love as I can. If you're trying to get backstage and you can't, it might be because you don't have the proper credentials. The amazing thing about this is God gives us a way to get the credentials to open the door. His name is Jesus. John 3.16 states that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came and gave his life willingly to extend to us a free, no questions asked, all access backstage pass. All you have to do is ask. 
and let Jesus become the Lord and Savior of your life. The second thing, the door is an opening. There's a good possibility God might be trying to teach us a lesson in persistence and patience. We may not be ready to receive the things that we're seeking on the other side of the door. Sometimes God will give us an acorn instead of the entire tree because our internal foundation can't handle the tree just yet and it'll crush us. Sometimes God will use patience and persistence to strengthen you for what lies behind the door. Or you could just be standing there looking at the door. You walk the walk, you talk the talk, or you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. You know what lies behind the door is one of the sweetest things that you can capture. You know it's the best thing that you could ever obtain in your life. But you're just standing there looking at the door. You're not doing anything to receive it. And God's saying all you have to do is knock. Or maybe, here's a possibility, you might have just ding-dong ditched the gates of heaven. For those of you that don't know what Ding Dong Ditch is, and I am by no means, and this is on video, condoning this behavior. If you do this, leave me out of it. But what it is, you go up, you bang on the door, or you ring the doorbell, and you duck behind the bushes. You disappear. And you got to do it fast enough to not get in trouble when the door opens. Maybe you just ding-dong ditched heaven. You ran up, knocked, and because you were scared that if the door opened, it was going to cost you something, you took off running and hid. You have the necessary things to get you through the door, but you're worried that opening the door might require something out of you. God called me into ministry. It's cost me a lot. It almost cost me my marriage. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for my patience and persistence. I almost gave up, and so did Danae. In my experience, the only people that are going to get an all-access backstage pass are the people that are working at the event. Or you belong to security, a.k.a. you're an angel. (sighs) Ain't none of us in here angels. If you are, I would love to talk to you afterwards. (laughs) If you have a relationship with Jesus, you're working the event, whether you know it or not. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he issued the Great Commission, and that pertains to each and every person that belongs to Jesus. Go and make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey my commandments. He also stated that we must confess him before man. Sharing the gospel is going to cost you something. Especially in the world we live in. It's going to cost you. We have power over the enemy. We have power over the spirit of fear. So when we go up and we go, and Satan's like, he's going he's to ask you something. Take a hike, bro. I know what I'm getting. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. I don't care. Shut your mouth, devil. We have the authority to cancel fear. So when we go knock on the door to heaven, knowing the cost, knowing the goodness that lies behind the door, we can walk up to it with boldness and in confidence 
And we can knock on that thing with our heads held high until it opens. So how do we go and make disciples and in turn come more alive in Jesus? I've never been more alive in my faith than I am when I'm sharing the gospel with somebody. I come to life. Because I'm sharing the good news of what God did in my life with somebody that I know needs to hear it. Share the gospel with someone and see how alive you feel after. And how do you do it? You ask, you seek, and you knock. You ask for God's presence to go with you. He said He's going to. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Seek His face and you will find the things He desires for your life and you will find the will that He has for your life. And knock and the gates of heaven will be open for you. Y'all want to knock this morning? (laughs) I heard somebody knocking. Who wants to see the gates of heaven open in this place? Who wants to see revival in Athens? Y'all know the cost. But y'all, he makes it so easy. Knock. Ask me. And I'll give it to you. Seek me and you will find it. Knock and the door will be open. I'm going to invite the band back up here. If you guys do not, if there is anybody in here that does not have a relationship with Jesus, there will be prayer and ministry team members all around the room with a lanyard. Please go find one of them. Please. Don't wait. Y'all, I'm telling you, it's going to cost you something. But I can stand here confidently and tell you that the cost is 100% worth it. 100% worth it. If you've got something you've been asking God for. Don't stop. Come get on your face this morning and lay it at the altar. Y'all, I'm hungry. I've been walking through a season of loneliness. I've had moments where I've woke up. I'm like, God, I'm not sure if you're here. He quickly reminds me that he is. I have to get up every morning and I have to knock. Sometimes I got to kick the door. God, I need you. I can't do this without you. How hungry? How hungry are we? How bad do we want it? Stephen's ringtone is awesome. How bad do you want it, Stephen? Well, how bad, Phoenix, how bad do we want it? How bad do we want to see God move in our lives, in the lives of those around us, and in the heart of this city? How bad do we want it? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much. One, that you gave your son for us that he paid the cost that we owed. God, I just ask that you manifest yourself in here this morning. Holy Spirit, would you fall on us? Would you let heaven reign in this room? We love you. We thank you. God, I pray that you bless every person in here this week. In Jesus' name.